Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. An undefended human world, written by Despair. And Gnosa was a human world, founded by peaceful secession of the human empire. A whole bunch of human artists and scientists thought they knew better way to live. And eventually, they got big enough that the imperial government said, Fine. Show us, and deeded them the habitable world on the edge of human space. So 10,000 humans and 100 million tons of equipment went out into the empty world and sought to build their paradise. They got their infrastructure up and running in record time. Water and power, cities and roads, order farms and order factories, the works. They set up weird government based partly on voting and partly on just going out and doing stuff it seemed to work for them. They had a tiny police force, but they had no poverty and good psychiatric medication, so they didn't have much crime. They named one of themselves Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, but they didn't establish any armed forces for him to command. Fancy titles are nice, but actually being commanded would be contrary to their culture. He spent a lot of time organizing tabletop wargaming sessions, which he tended to win, and tossing around warship design challenges on the relevant engineering puzzle discussion boards. You might think that a world like that would be ripe for invasion. Well, nobody tried. Three reasons. First, no one was entirely certain the human empire wouldn't fight to protect him. They weren't part of the empire, per se, but there were a lot of friendly relationships. Second, the empire or not, they were still human. And a lot of people remembered how ripe for invasion Earth looked just before the Empire was founded. That hadn't gone well for anybody who tried. Finally, there wasn't much worth taking. Just scientists and artists, who were mostly publishing their work to the galaxy anyway. Once things got settled, and it was a very nice place to live, so they got a swarm of immigrants from the Empire, and a few more from elsewhere. Everybody was welcome, provided they passed acculturation. By 20 years after the founding, Encon NASA had a billion people on it, with cities and infrastructure to match. At which point the galaxy discovered something funny. Mix a scientist with an artist and you get an engineer. The Econassians had the best auto factories in the galaxy. Best designs, too. Every detail was a product of an expert's full attention and pride. The designs were published, but in formats that only the Econassian auto factories read natively. They had more manufacturing capability than they actually needed, so they sold the excess stuff to nearby worlds. They didn't use money internally, but Ekinessa was an entity built up by some very large bank accounts in foreign worlds. Which is why the fleet of Fnar raiders decided to attack the place after all. The fleet jumped straight to the edge of the Ekinessa's FDL interdiction, already moving fast and decelerating for contact. 70 milliseconds after jump, space traffic monitoring sent a fleet a form message telling them that their approach was dangerous and offering a safe path. The FNAR replied with a generic obscenity. Space traffic monitoring paged the police on call. The police officer on duty took a look at the incoming fleet, compared it to historical records, and called the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. I hope you're ready for this, he said. The Supreme Commander paged manufacturing on call to request emergency extra quota. He got it. About ten minutes after the FNAR jump, auto factories across Enkidnasa put aside their normal load to create minimal spaceships, less than two meters long with fast engines, every single energy projector and heavily encrypted comms. There was no room for crew. The ships were powered by small antimatter batteries and could last about three hours of heavy activity. The design was a product of a competition on a mecking golf forum and the Supreme Commander had run a few weeks earlier. Best 500 comma he'd ever spent. Half an hour later, the first of the mini ships completed quality checks and launched. The FNAR were most of the way to Eknessa. About an hour after the jump, the FNAR arrived in Inkotnessa and found the guarded by over a thousand small ships. Even so, they outmassed and outgunned the defenders. They opened fire. This proved a frustrating experience. Each miniship maneuvered quickly and unpredictably. It took several tries to score a direct hit, 
The miniships didn't have much shielding, but they had enough that wide beam weapons weren't effective. Direct hits were effective, resulting in very satisfying explosions, but the Ekinassans were adding ships to the field faster than the Efnar could destroy them. The Efnar launched drop pods and of infantry, but regretted it at once. The miniships made short work of those. Briefly, the Efnar captain contemplated turning mash drivers against the Ekinassan cities, but that was madness. He was already betting his life, and more, that human empire would ignore a war against an independent human settlement. They wouldn't ignore war crimes. The Supreme Commander was getting frustrated, too. The miniships were defending nicely, but they didn't have the raw power to punch through the FNAR shields. He considered creating another class of ship, but the manufacturing latency was too high. He needed a solution now. He called one of his friends, more a puzzle gamer than a war gamer, but still generally fun to hang out with, and an expert on shields. Most people don't think much about shields. They stop stuff, sure. If the exact wrong pattern of energy hits them, they suffer resonance and explode. But the odds of that pattern occurring are about a trillion to one, and finding that pattern deliberately is very obscure art. Like picking tumbler locks, only with more differential equations. The very best shields, that is, the ones designed by Eknessa, have special dampeners to protect against the sort of attack. The Afnar didn't have those. They were a warrior people who didn't take warnings published in mathematical journals seriously. The two defenders probed the Afnar flagship shield generator together for almost 20 minutes before it yielded to a singular matrix decompression attack. The flagship lost its yielding immediately. The Supreme Commander offered the opportunity to surrender. The high officers would be put on trial, but the rest of the crews would be spared. The Efnar chose to run instead. The many ships following, probing for the exact coefficients that unshield each ship and then destroying them. By the time the Efnar reached the edge of FDL interdiction, there weren't many left. Those that were jumped immediately, not waiting for each other. The many ships had no jump engines, so the pursuit ended there. The Supreme Commander briefly pondered how to best express power at a distance before settling on the obvious. Drawing on the planet's large foreign currency reserves, he put up bounties on the officers' heads. Cleanup took days. The heads were received and paid for. The trash, including thousands of miniships with dead batteries, was cleared from near Inconessa space and dumped in recyclers. The manufacturing backlog was cleared. Even the parades and festivals eventually quieted down. The central government met to consider the question of building a real military. Eventually, they sided against it. It would run contrary to the culture, after all. And besides, they clearly didn't need one. End of story. Story number two. Soft cover, written by Nerdy White Male. What are you doing? Stop, stop at once and tell me what you're doing. Mechanized unit leader Don yelled through his translator at the human... The humans were new to the Alliance, and this one was defacing this attack ship. This one had obviously come in on the last reinforcement ship along with these updated attack craft. Just giving her a name of some sort. The human glanced at Don's uniform and tacked on a sir through his translator. To Daniel, Daniel Handy. Me barked as he shot to attention. Fifteen minutes later, unit leader Don, Lieutenant Daniel, and human liaison officer Mark Hughes were all sitting around a conference table. It's not vandalism, it's culture. Humans have always named and painted art on their ships. It's part of how we bond with it. It also has a practical side effect on close air support crops such as these. Lieutenant Daniel will elaborate. As he spoke, he tapped his pad, bringing up images of ships with dragon prowls, eyes painted on them, planes with shark jaws, and leaping tigers. And oh, sir, th these ships are, are tough, and uh, we can make them and still keep them in the air. This is complicated by having them fight in both space and atmosphere. Lieutenant Daniel tapped on his pad as a hollow of a new attack ship floated above his table. It's going to carry a lot of extra stuff to fly and fight in those both, so they are light in armor. If we get hit by a penetrator, we're toast. If we get targeted by any of the dozens of seeking munitions and the countermeasures fail, we're toast. The only thing the armor will stand up to is small arms fire, and not all of that. So we give them something to shoot at. Here, right over the cargo space, 
There are no important systems there, and it is double the armor of the rest of the ship the same as the engines. Unit leader Don blinked his eyes at the lieutenant. You wish to be shot at? No, 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 no. I, I don't, in fact, wish to, in fact, I'm hoping that uh, all the extra kilos of engine that was packed into it mean that I am there and gone before the bugs even notice me. But when they do see me, I want them shooting at anything other than the engines or me. The cargo old seems to be like the place to be the most afford to lose. Lieutenant Daniel touched the hollow demonstrating what would happen in the event of the destruction of that part of the ship. Most of the taps resulted in the computer reporting the ship destroyed or disabled. Unit leader Don popped in and said, I see. Given that it is part of your culture, and you have demonstrated that it does have practical purpose, I prove. The paint you are using is not suitable for this purpose, though. Go see the quartermaster for ultra reflective paint. The bugs, as you so put it, see in a different spectrum than we do. Liaison officer Mark waited until they were back in the hangar deck before the senior officer spoke. That was some mighty fine BS there, Lieutenant. Do you know why I had you explain the practical side? Um, no, sir, Lieutenant Daniel said. It's because you didn't inform me of your art project. You blindsided me and the rest of your squad, and it almost blew up in our faces. We need this alliance, and we are not big enough to go it alone. This alliance has already advanced our FDR research by 50 years, just by letting us study their sublight engines. Okay, you are now responsible for all ship art. And Lieutenant, liaison officer, Mark glanced at the half-finished painting adorning the cargo bay door. Put some clothes on them. End of story. I just want to thank the T5 patrons and channel members. Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Australia the Dreamer, Trigger 95, Fjord Gyol, Meridian 117, Elysia, Jordan Buxbaum, Angry Marine, Albard and Gasta, and Barky. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.